The Speaking From Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, presented by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus to share their experience and wisdom with students and the local community. In this episode, we present Pete Johnson, founder of Pete's Greens. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Speaking From Experience. Uh, tonight we have a great program for you. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm going to take advantage of you all sitting here for some commercial messages. Uh, first, uh, our next speaker uh, is on November 28th. And it is a person near and dear to my heart because it's one of my former students. Jay Jenny graduated in 2010 and is now running a very successful fitness business out in Williston um, called uh, Champlain Valley CrossFit. He'll be here on the 28th of November, and it should be a great show. Um, and then I'll just give you a quick uh, preview of the Springs program. Uh, in, on January 22nd, we have Annie Bourdon, who's uh, started a really interesting uh, organization called Vermont Car Share Vermont, which is for all those people, it's sort of like timeshare, but with a car. And it's a great uh, answer to uh, traffic and uh, pollution woes. Come on in, guys. There's uh, some seats around here. Uh, there's one in the back there. Um, so she'll be great. Uh, then in uh, March, we have Paul Routley, who is the founder and publisher of Seven Days, uh, Vermont's weekly alternative newspaper, although quite frankly, it's hard to call them the alternative these days because they're, um, they're going gangbusters. And in a, in a world where uh, the newspaper, the print newspaper business is going through tremendous uh, difficulties these last few years with the internet, they're growing at 20% a year. So that'll be a fascinating talk. And then we're gonna wrap it up in April, April 2nd, with something a little different uh, from the world, the creative world of television. We're gonna have Rob Lezebnik, who is the co-executive producer of The Simpsons. And uh, that should be uh, a good one as well. So that's the spring, uh, and then I'm back. Pat Boera coming in here tonight reminded me that I have to remind everyone that the elevator pitch <laughs> is happening again. It's all you students. I notice there's some freshmen in the audience. Uh, this is a big opportunity for you to uh, develop some very important life skills. So our elevator pitch competition will be in February and there'll be plenty more about that um, in the weeks uh, to come. But I just want to mention it now. Um, but those are my commercial messages. Now it's my uh, uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our co-sponsor for this event, which is Sustain Champlain, and the uh, and we have another sponsor, Valerie Esposito from the Environmental uh, Policy Program. Uh, but uh, I want to in, in introduce Christina Erickson, who is from who runs Sustain Champlain, a great organization on campus that makes sure. Do we have? Are we have too many lights tonight? What do we think? We'll, we'll be dimming them. Okay, we'll be dimming them, okay. Um, and Christina will say a few words and introduce our speaker tonight. So, Christina. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And I have to say, when Bob and Valerie and I got together last spring to start thinking about ideas of who we could include in the speaker, we started thinking about, all right, the environmental field, who's doing what uh, in the state in an entrepreneurial way, and instantly, uh, Pete and many of his friends and colleagues up in the Craftsbury, Hardwick, Northeast Kingdom region came to mind because of all of the great work that they have brought and continue to bring to that area um, in the terms of agriculture, food-related issues. And it's really been um, pretty amazing to watch the, the growth of this program. And, and a personal <coughs> story is I remember um, when I lived in Craftsbury a few years ago, that uh, Pete put a call out to his friends to do some roofing on his first wash house, which was on his parents' homestead um, in Greensboro. And I remember learning to pound some of my first nails on this corrugated roof, um, which had you know a couple of, of uh, rustic, shall we say, wash basin, basins and some old um, 
dryers that just used for the spin cycle or washing machines on the spin cycle to spin out the water and the greens. And the greens were kind of where it all began, but Pete has really expanded this whole, um, his whole farming and his whole system to beyond just to salad greens. And he's going to share that story uh, that he brings from very early on knowing that this was kind of the field that he was going to uh, direct and, and how that fits into a larger system that's really been a model that many people from across the country, across the world, have turned to um, as this large success story. So um, it's really a pleasure to bring back an old friend and neighbor um, to our campus and hear his story. And some of you, actually, any of you uh, get Pete's Green's CSA delivery in Burlington? All right, a few Shelby customers. Supermarket. Oh, oh uh, there you go, by Method Market. Um, Pete does have a CSA membership, which I'm sure he'll, he'll mention. Um, Delivered to Valerie's house is one of the delivery spots in Burlington. There you go, <laughs> testimonials. Um, now your name's familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, Pete Johnson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. This is this is great. It's fun to be over here. Um, Christina sort of brought back some memories of the old days. Um, Pete's Green started about 15 years ago. My, my parents had a little farm, a little like homestead farm in, in Greensboro. I don't know how many of you have been up there, but this is all about an hour and a quarter to the northeast of here. It's sort of uh, high rolling hills, really, really pretty country. Um, lots of open fields, lots of woods. Not really the mountains, but sort of the foothills. Um, so I, I went to Middlebury College, I graduated. I, I, knew, I knew since I was 14 I wanted to be a farmer of some sort. I don't know why I knew that, I just did. And I went back there and started growing greens, baby greens, and uh, built a greenhouse or two. And uh, it's just been this amazing evolution ever since then. Um, we're, we're relatively big now for a Vermont vegetable farm, even though we're still tiny in the scheme of the world in growing vegetables. But uh, there's been a lot of transitions. We bought a farm in the mean, actually we've bought two farms now in the meantime. Uh, we had a big fire a couple of years ago where we lost our facility and we built a new facility. Um, and we've uh, just learned and gained experience and all kinds of stuff and it's uh, sort of this never ending, like most businesses, you know, they just continue to progress and you never quite know where you're headed. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to give you sort of a brief synopsis of what we do at Pete's Greens and I'm going to talk more about the, the wider Hardwick region and uh, relationships that we have with other businesses up there. The, the most exciting story up there is is the collaborations and uh, relationships between these ag-based businesses in the area up there and how we've all really worked together and built sort of a new economy in the last 10 years. It's really just getting rolling now. And what's really exciting is, is, the, is the things that are developing out of that. Um, and it's been an amazingly fun ride for me and, and the other folks involved. And I'm really excited to see where it's headed. Is it, am I loud enough? Is that good? Yeah, OK. Um, Part of our crew, this is, uh, we have nice, one big nice flat field in Craftsbury, and now we, we lease land around the area. We kind of travel all over the place, but this is Baby Green's production. <coughs> Here's a greenhouse. We heat, we heat just a couple greenhouses. We actually have three acres under plastic. Uh, we heat just a couple of them with uh, waste vegetable oil and now some waste motor oil. Uh, this, you can see starts getting started in the spring here. Some more. This is how greenhouses look this time of year, going into the winter with, with greens. Feel free to ask questions at any point here. This is very free form. Uh, Steve getting the, these greenhouses actually move. We have several greenhouses that slide twice a year. This is a 35 by 200 foot greenhouse that slides on tracks um, for reasons that are time consuming to explain. Um, but it allows us to get more production out of it by, by uh, moving it twice a year and also helps keep uh, pests and diseases under control by having two different soil locations. We, were, we thought we were going to get 70 mile an hour winds last night, so we were really busy all day yesterday preparing these greenhouses. Um, we got like 30 mile an hour winds, so it's great. Um, this is the first greenhouse we built on this property. This is a half acre. It's all made out of local, local wood, um, spruce and fir and cedar. And uh, it's kind of homespun, but it actually works really well. And uh, we, it was great when we didn't have any money, but we had a lot of time. And we were able to build this. 
now we don't have any time or money. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a winter project for three or four of us, and it's been a real steady producer for us. You can see, this is just how it looks, just time, this is a couple year old picture, but this is head lettuce here, and some bunching kale, and ruby streaks mustard. And we'll pick this stuff out of here until about mid-December, and then it gets too cold. Um, there's some covers to go in there to help keep it warm, some blankets, but no, no added heat at all. Ah, uh, this is in the spring. We'll have, uh, we have these beds. This is a heated greenhouse, and we'll grow peppers. You see peppers right here? They'll be there all summer. They'll get like six feet tall, but we're growing scallions and Napa cabbage on the side for additional production first thing in the spring to help afford the heat to heat the place. This has been a really successful strategy for us, all this intercropping and very tight cropping. You need super fertile soil to do this. We're always adding lots of compost and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. I hate looking at old pictures because things have changed so much, you know. Um, this is, yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's a field of kale. We, we crop about 80 acres now and then we have about another 70 acres that we're preparing for the next year with cover cropping and uh, getting the soil ready. Um, we are, it's interesting in our area, land is a scarce resource, even though there's a lot of it and there's not a lot of people, there's only you know, 700 people live in my town, that we're surrounded by dairy farms that are actually doing really well. Um, there's a, a lot of doom and gloom about dairies, but the large ones that are still going um, are, are quite successful ec economically when they look at their business over a five year period. They have, they have whole year and a half periods where they lose money every day but then they'll really make good money for a year and a half, two years. And the ones we're surrounded by are big players. They're like land speculators, and they have a lot of cows, and they have real estate, and so it's hard for us to acquire more land. Um, when a farm, farms almost never come up for sale. When they do, it's usually a, a backdoor deal. There's no realtor involved for the most part. Um, and even leasing land is quite competitive and, and hard. Um, so just recently, we've really started to make some inroads in getting more land close to our farm. We've been traveling like four and five miles away for land which is, is tedious. The good thing about going to other farms is that all these kind of vegetables tend to have pest and disease problems over time. Some of you have gardens and have seen that in your garden. So if we have a problem, this is our main field here, like with onion disease, say we can move to an entirely different field for the next year and just leave the disease behind, be in a fresh place. That's been really successful for us. There's there's a lot of, we're certified organic and there's a lot of sprays and whatnot you can use that are organic, but we tend to not to use hardly any of them. We tend to just have these big rotations to keep uh, pests and diseases and even weeds sort of a step behind us. And usually it's pretty successful. Um, and with climate change, we're, we're getting more and more different pests here every year. Uh, there's a really scary one coming, I actually just showed up this year called spotted, spotted wing drosphelia. And it, it eats, it burrows into soft fruits like strawberries and raspberries, lays eggs that hatch maggots that you can't see until you eat it. So customers are biting into strawberries and getting actual maggots, like meat maggots in their strawberry. That's, it came from China six years ago. It marched across the country. It just showed up here this fall. Um, and there's more and more things like that. So rotations and good practices are becoming more and more important as we see these pests that we've never even heard of before. Uh, we try to mechanize wherever we can. This is actually an old shot. We've, we've gone to a wider bed now with a little bit bigger tractors. But this is a greens harvester. There's a little blade right in here that cuts the greens. They go up a belt. Deb stands back there and collects them. Um, it's growing vegetables in a diversified fashion like we do is extremely labor intensive. There's just, you need hands for many, many projects. This is one place where we've saved a lot over the years, and actually the quality of the, of the product is a little bit better because it hasn't been touched, it hasn't been squeezed by people's hands. We used to cut it with knives. Um, and so we try to, wherever we can, we just bought a root harvester <clears throat> this fall. It's a machine that drives along and picks beets and carrots and turnips and conveys them up and cuts the top off and puts them in a bin. And <coughs> Most of these things, though, you need a reasonable scale in order to justify the expense. So part of our strategy has been to grow in order to have better equipment um, so that we could do things more efficiently. And we're sort of just starting to hit the economy of scale that makes that work. Um, it's not an instant thing by any means. And you have to be a good enough grower to grow. I mean, these, these greens have to be really uniform and really done right in order for this to work. 
Uh, yeah, more greenhouse stuff. Here's some of the blankets I was referring to. We, we use a lot of these row covers outdoors in the summertime and inside in the wintertime to just keep things a little bit warmer. It's amazing that the little bit of protection that that provides, what a difference it makes. This is an interesting crop. You can't see it very well. It's called Claytonia or miner's <coughs> lettuce. It's a winter, it's a weed on the West Coast. In uh, Central California, it's just, it's a winter weed. And it's the hardiest green we can grow here in the wintertime. It's, it's hardier than spinach. And it can deal with the really high humidity in a, in a winter greenhouse. So we rely on this a lot in the wintertime, and our customers actually really like it. Um, and they miss it in the summer. This plant will not grow in the summer. If it's too nice and sunny, it just will not grow. It actually will like shrink in size. It likes it really like cloudy and damp and cold, and it will grow in an unheated greenhouse in January in Craftsbury, Vermont, which is pretty amazing. Not much, just a little bit, but it, it is growing. There's a onion and potato harvester. It just lifts them up, puts them on the ground. There, we have a, a six member, two families, H2A. H2A is a visa program. Mexican crew that comes in the summer. Our crew, overall crew is about 20 folks. 12 of those are full-time year-round, um, all managerial in some way. And uh, we got these two awesome families from Mexico. This year, one family sent all girls, the other family, family sent all boys. Everybody's getting along great. It's, it's been a great season. Um, not, not in like how you think, but just <laughs> the girls are all more experienced. So the guys have to take direction from the girls, which is not a, you know, typical Mexican situation. Um, but it's worked out really well and we had a good, good year. And uh, they're, they're really respectful. They live, we have a big farmhouse with three apartments. They live in there and they're just a pleasure to have. And they'd be really hard for us to do what we do without them because they're skilled. They're, they're super skilled and they're seasonal. And we'd have to have about 10 local folks to replace them. And we'd almost need like an HR department to deal with all the issues of a seasonal 10 person local crew. Um, so we're really lucky in this program. It, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy. The program changes every year, but at least they're safe when they're here. They're not undocumented and they can fly back and forth, which is really nice for them. Um, so it's worked out well for us. Uh, it's just some soil prep stuff. We do a lot of things to reduce weeds. We try to do as little hand weeding as possible. This is a little weeder that we're using before we plant a crop to kill weeds a few times. There's some vegetables. We grow pretty much everything you can grow here. We grow sweet potatoes. We grow ginger now, which has been a cool new crop for us. Lots of greenhouse crops, tomatoes and peppers, all that kind of stuff. All the hardy greens. The right hand corner is a um, little white salad turnips that are really popular. You got basil down here. Um, diversification is, is uh, both really tough and really valuable for us. We're diversified both in all the stuff we grow and also all the different ways we sell it. We have a CSA, some of you might not know, that's basically people sign up, we deliver a, a set amount of produce to you every week, but you don't know what it's gonna be until the night before when we send out the newsletter. Um, you pay us ahead of time, or mostly ahead of time. That's one way to market our food. We go to one farmer's market in Montpelier, that's another way. We sell to about 100 stores and restaurants throughout Vermont and uh, a little bit in Boston through the year. Uh, we have a little farm stand at our place. And now we're doing things like there's a new company called Farmers to You that's gathering Vermont food and taking it to Boston for sort of their own CSA down there. And they become a really key customer of ours. And we really like that kind of thing because we can just give them food and not have to worry about, we don't want to run a business in Boston. We want people who know how to do that to do that. Um, but this guy is potentially going to be growing fast and is a really key customer of ours now. Um, but, the, but the selling mix is constantly changing. Restaurants come and go, things happen. Um, so we have a, you know, basically one sales guy who's pretty on that and, and getting the word out all the time. And um, it's pretty, pretty important. And the diversity, you know, being diversified in how you sell things is, is helpful. There's, there's times, in, there's weeks in the summer in Vermont, for whatever reason, stores and restaurants have a bad week for you know, the weather or whatever it was. So to have other markets that are not dependent upon that is really a, a nice balancing act. There's also things we can do with our food. You know, things come in different sizes, different shapes, and we can kind of send things to certain markets based on what they want. And, um, but 
all these different crops, all these different sizes, all these different shapes, all these different, and we grow, we grow five colors of carrots, and we sell them in different sizes sometimes. So it gets complicated, and uh, there's a lot to it. Some farm stand stuff. Some beets. This is sort of a typical CSA share you might get in uh, late August or early September. There's uh, pregnant Melissa with our farm stand. This has been fun. We do 100,000 bucks a year in this farm stand that's self-serve right on this quiet little road in Craftsbury. And we have very little theft. We have a, a little bit every year that we usually catch pretty fast. Um, but most of our customers are really proud that it's self-serve. And that you hear them telling you know, friends or neighbors or visitors that they have that this place is self-serve. Isn't it cool we can do this? And, and we just leave the money totally open in a change drawer. We don't even have a drop box or anything. And there's a lot of expensive food in there. There's meat, there's dairy products, there's all kinds of stuff. And uh, it's actually growing rapidly. This part of our business is, is really going up nicely. So it's been a fun, fun thing to have. And we're actually looking at the possibility of a real retail store in a busier place is probably our, our next big growth thing if we decide to do something. Uh, we grow, uh, if you ever want to get attention to a building, grow plants on the roof. It's, uh, that's, that's our farm stand, and it's amazing the, the attention that brings. Here's a piece of washing equipment. There's uh, scrubbers back beyond that, that, and water spraying to clean these beets. And then these white rollers are sponge rollers that take the water off and kind of polish them up a little bit. Um, just a simple device. There's the barn that burned. I, hope, I didn't actually look at these pictures before I came here, so <laughs> hopefully there's a picture of the new building, too. Um, this burned uh, January 12th, two, two years ago. We had all of our washing and processing downstairs, a bunch of stuff stored upstairs, and all of our food was stored downstairs. It was only in the middle of winter. We grow now about 30 acres of crops that this time of year we pack into storage. This is beets, carrots, potatoes, turnips, rutabagas, cabbage, all these things that we'll store in some cases eight months, nine months, that sort of thing. Um, so this, this coming up week, sort of the last week of filling up our storage. So we were only about halfway through selling our storage that year when it burned. And that was the saddest part going through the rubble was finding like, we also have a freezer. We had like frozen strawberries and, and frozen chickens and all kinds of great stuff like that. We had an electrical box, a three-phase converter that apparently blew up. We, we didn't ever totally confirm it, but um, it started, it went fast. There was no, the house almost went too, actually. There was no, no save in the barn. Um, so that was an interesting experience, and it led to a whole bunch of stuff that um, was also interesting. <laughs> we, this is the stage it was at when it burned. We were adding on to it. We were doubling the size of it. Um, but we knew that was sort of only a two or three year solution to our, our growth rate. Um, we, didn't really, we didn't really have the guts to go do what we really needed to do. And then it burned and then we had to. So there it is. Oh, terrible. Yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. Yeah. It actually was not nearly as traumatic as, as you might imagine, for me at least. It was, you know, we've actually we've had some barn fires in our area over the over the years, and I've I've kind of noticed them and paid attention, realizing that I had a big barn with mostly actually new good wiring, and this this box that we think blew up had almost brand new wiring, but they're big buildings, they're wood, they're you know dry as can be, they're super airy, um, it's not hard to burn them down. So I'd pondered it, and then it just kind of happened, and then everything after that happened too, and. Um, it wasn't a major, terrible event for us. The day, couple of days after was kind of grim. <laughs> so then we built, we had, this is middle of January. Um, we, we knew we needed to stay in business. We had all these employees and everything. And so we spent uh, basically March 10th, two months later, we broke ground on a new building. We made a trip to Europe in the meantime to look at some facilities. Um, and this guy, Isaac, who, who works with me, is my best buddy and he happens to be a great carpenter. And he basically pulled this off. He built this thing. It's 16,000 square feet. It's uh, actually, it's more than that. It's like 25,000 square feet. 16,000 square foot feet is the footprint. 
Um, it's super insulated. What you're, what you're seeing here, we built wall panels on the ground so that we could build the wall panels while we did the site work, the concrete work, because we were short on time. So this is the thickness of a cooler wall right here. It's uh, 28 inches thick, I think. And then, so then we stood up that panel, it's 24 feet high, and we blew cellulose insulation to those walls, which is uh, recycled newspaper. We used five tractor trailer loads in the whole building, but it's all super insulated. It takes very little to heat or cool it. And uh, it's a system that seems to have worked out really well. And basically it was self-designed. We, we figured it out and uh, ran it by a bunch of engineers who some of them thought it was good and some of them thought it wasn't. But by the time we talked them all the way through it, we were able to convince them all that it was a good idea even though it was unconventional. And uh, it really worked out well. And it was a good example of this building, we were in it by middle of June. It wasn't done by then. But um, every step along the way, all the contractors and everybody helping us was aware of our time pressure. And that actually made it way easier than a normal project because you were either with us or not with us on day one, and we could figure that out pretty fast. There's the um, concrete. This is in a different site from our old barn. This is down by our greenhouses and facilities and whatnot. Walls going up. That's the uh, cooler. There's Isaac. So we have lot. We built it so high because we're stacking produce. 24 feet high in the air, and we also have big upstairs storage spaces and offices and things like that. Oops. There it is, getting along towards. It's a little warehouse you looking. <laughs> we didn't spend a lot of time considering how it was going to look. <laughs> uh, but we have some plans to spruce that up. Yeah, this is kind of how it is now, looking down from upstairs. There's, there's more washing equipment and stuff now, but it's basically a, a big open space with lots of wash lines. This is a big cooler back in here where all our produce goes. There's a freezer in the back corner. We have a commercial kitchen where we um, freeze things for the winter. This is a good example. This is squash puree. I'll talk more about our relationships with other companies, but uh, there's a seed company near us called High Mowing Seeds, and they grow a lot of winter squash and pumpkins for the seed. And we take the flesh and puree it and, and sell it to our members, and we give a lot away too because they kind of produce more than we can sell. Um, but it, we do like 15,000 pounds a year of this wonderful squash puree, and it's a really great partnership between two businesses. Worked out well. Cabbage getting ready to go in the cooler. This is all onions out under the shed drying before they go into the cooler. There's Tim, he does our sales and our packing. Here's our kitchen. Um, it's pretty industrial, it's a lot of big cookers, and we do a lot of bulk freezing spinach, broccoli, corn squash, peppers. We like roast red peppers in a big chili roaster and then freeze them. Um, not so much like meals and things like that, although we are starting to get into that a little bit, but it's, it's mostly bulk preservation, sauerkraut, things like that. Things that make it easier for local folks to eat local food without doing all the work. Um, and also it's a way for us to preserve gluts um, not just from our farm, but we buy produce from other farms that have gluts on things um, because it's actually it's pretty hard to predict quantities that you need to grow throughout the year with the climate as variable as ours. So it'll get really hot and humid, and a lot of food will come in, and people have extra corn or whatever. We'll buy it, we'll freeze it. I think that's cauliflower there. It's been a great, um, great way to reduce stress for me because in the past we used to waste a lot of food sometimes because we couldn't market it at all. Those are mildly hot peppers getting frozen. That's the squash getting ready to be pureed. I don't know what he's doing there. Uh, roasting tomatillas for uh, salsa verde. Dried peppers. Uh, this is something else we do. We grow, we grow shoots in the wintertime under lights in the greenhouse. Radish, pea, and sunflower shoots. They're really tasty. We raised 
chicken. Oh, those are turkeys, actually. We raised chickens and turkeys and pigs. I like pigs. <laughs> nice animals. Farm stand shots. I think that's it. So anyway, um, what's going on in our area is, I don't know how many, many of you have been to Hardwick. I see Rusty's in the back here. R Rusty, how did they find your v recent video about Hardwick? Uh, mixed, mixed review. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, look up the logger and there's, he did a, a video recently about uh, how Hardwick has changed. Hardwick, Hardwick is the town in Vermont that everybody in the state knows a joke about Hardwick because it was the joke town. Um, an example is, how do you know the toothbrush was invented in Hardwick? Well, otherwise it would be the teeth brush. And most of them are much cruder than that. Um, but it was pretty downtrodden town, a lot of people on welfare. Um, used to have a granite industry there that um, went away a long time ago. And in no particular growth in the economy, it was sort of a logging, farming town. Logging's been depressed for a while. Lots of sawmills that have been going out of business. Um, and just sort of by happenstance, this, this sort of new wave of entrepreneurial food businesses sprung up there about 10 years ago. Uh, there's Jasper Hill, which is a, a cheese operation in Greensboro. Uh, high mowing seeds, which is, they grow seeds. Pete's Greens, we do, you know what we do. Um, Vermont Soy is a soy product, and they also make uh, Vermont Natural Coatings. They make a, 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 a milk whey-based wood finish. Those are kind of the four key ones that got started about the same time. Um, and we, from the very start, have been very cooperative with each other. Now there's a whole new wave. We have a distillery now. We have a, a great little distribution company that's moving a lot of this food around. Uh, a lot of you probably know Hill Farmstead Beer. They're up in Greensboro. Um, and all of us are ag or food related in some way. Most of us are very based on local production. Um, we're, we're doing something with food that's produced, you know, within 100 miles of here. And then there's a smaller one's coming online now. There's Sweet Rowan Dairy. I don't know if he's over in Burlington yet, but he's bottling milk and making cheese. There's, you know, there hasn't really been a dairy farm that's bottled their own milk, like a startup, in a long time in Vermont. So it's very exciting. He's, he actually was in one of the pictures. He was an employee of ours for a while. And there's, there's 15 or 20 others that are just, like, getting going and about ready to spring. Um, and... This whole process has been really interesting because there was little of this going on. There was some going on. There were sort of like hippies that went there in the 60s and started farms. And a lot of those farms, some of those farms were still there. But they were very non-entrepreneurial in, in many ways and sort of anti-business and very set on staying a certain scale. And most of us are not that way. Most of us are interested in growing and, and having more jobs and making, you know, having a bigger gross income and all this kind of stuff. So um, in the last, you know, these four businesses that I mentioned now have 130 employees and gross 15 million bucks a year. And we're all on, we're the slowest growers of all. We grow like 15% a year. Some of these guys are growing like 50% a year and they're, and they're grossing 4 million bucks. So it's just going to be like this huge trajectory. Um, so we're looking at within another 10 years, probably, you know, $50 million of business being done in this area and probably three or four hundred jobs is kind of a, a guess. Um, and the most interesting part of it for me has been the cooperative and collaborative nature of the whole thing. Um, right from the very start we, we started having business owner group meetings the first Tuesday of every month and this has been a super powerful thing. Um, whoever is sort of in a, in a food related business in, with a couple exceptions in the area is invited to come. We go to one operation per, per month and that person hosts. We have a potluck and basically we just all bring stuff that we're selling, you know, it's just, a, just a food from our businesses. And then every time we go to a place there's a topic that the, that the host picks. And usually it's something that they're struggling with. Um, it's usually employee related, <laughs> turns out. But usually it starts out the topic is not that so much. It's like, how do I make this part of my business run better? And then sort of evolves around it. How do I find the right people to do this? But um, it's been super powerful because we all are in different fields, 
but we all, there's so many similarities between our businesses and yet some real differences too. And we're able to really watch what each other is doing and learn from each other. And uh, I can't emphasize enough if you're ever out there in a business starting something up, if you can find a group like that or start a group like that to associate, um, especially with people not exactly in your same field, but related in some way, um, it's been so powerful. And I, I think probably a solid 30 or 40 percent of the growth we've seen can be directly attributed to that group and talking to each other and the fact that we don't have to we don't all have to learn we don't all have to learn the same stuff we can just steal stuff from the other guy who already learned it um, you know Jasper Hill is this dairy farm that makes cheese and they have a big aging facility and stuff and they just built a methane digester to process their cow manure and part of that there's a greenhouse so Tom Stearns and I the guy from the seed company were over there the other day teaching them how to grow things in their greenhouse and then I went into the cheese caves to learn about very precise temperature and humidity controls that they have that I need for my facility. And I could have spent a couple days online rooting around trying to figure stuff out and they just basically like zeroed me in on what I needed to do and you know in an hour, an hour in which I was walking around experiencing the culture of their place. You know I wasn't sitting at my computer just trying to find people that information. I was immersed in their business seeing how the boss relates to the employees and the employees relate, relate to each other and how they do things and yet I was also learning about the specific information I went there for and I went away just being like man that was just it was just an awesome experience even though I have I know so much about what they do already but I only make it over there for a real tour every three or four months and things really change a lot in three or four months and a business is growing at 30 percent a year um, so it's been such a cool thing and there's a little bit of a unstated but there's a little bit of a competitive thing going on too where we try to keep up with each other and that's been I think pretty powerful to see that well they're doing that and that makes a lot of sense and their employees love that how can, what can we do in our in our place to kind of hit a similar angle um, and it just sort of feeds on itself and now a really exciting thing that's happening is we have people moving to the area to work for one of us, but a lot of them have their own idea about a business they want to have eventually. So they might get a start working for one of us there. Paul's a great, great example, the guy who has the milk bottling thing. He worked for us for a couple of years, but he's always been really into cows and dairy. And, and we were able to make him a couple loans to help him get started in that whole project. And um, even though it has nothing to do with what we do whatsoever, um, we believe in what he wants to do and now he's really off and running has a great thing going and he'll be spinning off people before long and it's so fun to see the, you know these are pretty quiet hills we have up in, in that area and part of agriculture is culture and part of what we're bringing back to the area is this culture of people and families and associations that to me is the most exciting part of what's going on um, because there used to be you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small farms in, in those areas. Um, you know, a small farm 100 years ago was only 30, 40 acres. And uh, now we have these big dairies that are supporting one family on five or 600 acres. So we're trying to have smaller operations that can make a living and get a lot of diversity into the hills and just sort of see what comes out of that. And um, we have like no idea what the next 10 years is going to bring. It's really exciting. Good time for questions? Perfect. Yeah. Comments, ideas? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the people who work for you and the culture you're trying to create within your business? Yeah, we have um, kind of the gamut from Sterling College grads. Sterling College is right up on the hill there who, who you know, came there to go to an alternative school and they ended up working for us and stuck to um, some couple like real like local Vermont guys who are really good on equipment um, and to now a group of sort of influx from New York and down there of like real foodie people um, some of whom don't work out but a couple who have really stuck and are really running with some, some things there so it's it's sometimes a bit of a challenge to bring everybody together because people are from pretty different backgrounds um, and We've struggled with that a little bit recently. P part of our growth has been a, a little bit trying. But we have um, 
our cook makes lunch three or four days a week for us, and that's really key. We all, we all hang out and have lunch and talk about things. And uh, we're now starting to like work out in the morning together, a bunch of us, and that's been a fun addition. Because it's really grueling, the work at our place. It's uh, you know, long days, especially in the summer, and a lot of it's very monotonous. And uh, it's been good to have some regular interactions that are not just at the workplace. And a lot of what we're trying to keep up with these other companies on is like employee perks and how to make the place a really fun place to work. And they're actually ahead of us in, in, in a couple cases. But um, we do have health insurance, which is important. Um, and that's been a, a big thing for us to provide. Um, but we're really looking at what we can do to, because some of these folks have been with us now for 10 years. And we really want them to be looking at the next 10 years and beyond. Um, Yeah. So thinking about that, um, like, do you deal with the wages as well and kind of how do you? Yeah. So I mean, we have we have several folks that make fifty grand a year, um, a whole other class of folks that make forty grand a year. A lot of people have bought houses working for us. Um, they work hard. I mean, it's not <laughs> it's not a free ride by any means, but uh, we feel really good about. I mean, the idea with being larger and having more equipment is that you can pay your crew better. That's sort of the, the net result of that, we hope. We're not really, we're hoping we achieve that eventually. Um, but we, uh, we have certain people who are more or less partners at this point because they're so critical to the business. We're, we're probably heading towards some sort of actual partnership before very long. Um, but we do not like to have turnover and we do not like to start with a fresh crew every spring. We like long-term established folks who are good at what they do and take care of things. And that's been a real uh, commitment to us. And, and being in business year round has really helped us with our cash flow and to be able to achieve that. But it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. What are some of the new things your company's going to do in the next couple of years to drive innovation? Well, that's a good question. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of a real challenge now because we, as we've gotten bigger and a little bit better known, opportunities come to us all the time. And we're to sort of the point now where it used to be like, I would just be like, oh, let's do that, or let's not do that. Usually, let's do it was, it was the answer. And that gets dangerous after a while because it affects a lot of other people besides me. And I'm not the best at sort of understanding how it affects the whole operation anymore. Other people are better at that than I am. So we're, we're actually working with somebody this winter to help us learn how to best analyze new opportunities. Things we're considering are a, a real retail establishment somewhere. Um, a large greenhouse complex at a, at a landfill up, up north of us. Um, those are the two big things. Um, but we are also trying to be conscious of just how big and spread out we want to be. And that's a tough question to answer. Um, so we're in a very quite uncertain, but quite exciting, actually, at the moment um, position there. Um, but it's not nearly as, uh, we used to just kind of pick stuff up without a lot of real deep thought, and it's very different now. Yeah? I'm from the area, and there's a lot going on in the NK with JP. <coughs> yeah. Everything going on. Um, what are your plans? Do you plan to increase or you know, gain business with everything that's going on in the area? Or you mean the JP stuff? Yeah. JP and you know, coming into Burke Mountain, that's a little cool. Yeah. I mean, we're, we, we've been in good contact with those guys, and, and so far, I've pretty much liked what's gone, gone on. You know, it's, it's um, there's going to be some big changes up there. We hope not too much. Um, we're always trying to get, get good food to folks. And we're actually finding that north, our markets have always been like Montpelier and over here. And now, like north of us, Newport, Linneville, Burke, there's really not much farming going on over there. I don't really understand why. Um, so we are sending CSA shares north and dealing with more stores and whatnot. Um, and there's a lot of demand in those areas, so yeah, it's it's we're sort of in a nice spot to be able to reach both both places. Um, J Peak may be a partner in this whole greenhouse complex if we do it. They're really J Peak. Some of you probably heard, but they're part of their whole program is they want to have a really strong agritourism component. So when people are there, it's raining on Tuesday afternoon. The skiing's not that good. They want to put people on a bus and have a really nice tour to go on. So a year-round heated greenhouse you know, 10 miles from the mountain is really appealing to them. Um, so it's been, uh, 
I mean, there's so many changes up there. There's, there's the wind towers in the low mountain range just north of us. You know, just got installed just now, and it's really a, things are happening fast in the area, an area that's been pretty quiet for a long time. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that in terms of to serve the uh, local market with locally produced foods, it seems like you're getting more into the processing. I mean, I ever, you know, I just figured you grow the, the stuff and you get it to market. You clean it, you wash it, you cook it in a lot, you yeah. package it, you freeze it. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a growing trend for you, just more of the pro what I'll call processing yeah. of the food? As to yeah, I think it's a growing trend for how people eat produce. I mean, you go to Europe and you almost, it's, in some parts of Europe, it's hard to find like a whole head of cauliflower now. It's, it's typically like in a more of a ready to stir fry mixed pack. It's really common over there. Kale over there, you can find it bunched in a, like we see, but usually it's, you can buy kale like 10 different ways chopped or somehow processed in Holland in, in like a convenience store oftentimes. Uh, they eat a ton of kale, they just buy it closer, closer to the consumption point. Um, so we think we've just scratched the surface with that. We're not sure if we're, you know, it's, it's a whole new different world, a whole different business. We do it in a way that very much fits into our current business. Um, we're exploring with things like now. We, grow, we have 600,000 pounds of storage crops that go into our cooler for the winter. And about, you know, 5 to 15% of those are seconds in some way or another, cosmetic blemishes, whatever. So we're playing around with like a diced root product, mixed root product that we could sell, um, various purees. Um, but it's, they're really like whole new businesses that require marketing and education and that kind of thing. And um, we'd rather just provide the raw ingredients to somebody who wanted to really do that, but we don't have anybody just yet. Um, so that's, that's a good example of an opportunity we know is there. We don't know if we should really be pursuing it or not. Yeah. So after the barn burned, there was an interesting financial or fundraising effort. Yeah. Uh, can you describe kind of how that spun off? And yeah. So we didn't have enough insurance on our, on our barn, which I still don't know if that was a good or bad thing. Um, turns out when you buy enough insurance, it's really expensive, <laughs> as we're learning now. Uh, we're spending like six times as much on insurance now as we used to spend. Um, so our barn was insured to a couple hundred thousand dollars. We, we figured the loss was about five hundred thousand dollars because none of the food was insured. Five, five or six hundred thousand. So I think partially because we had those pictures of how it burned, partially because it was January 12th, probably the quietest time of year in Vermont, it just became like this feeding frenzy of fundraisers to, to raise money for us. And it came to $160,000. They went on and on and on for months. It was an amazing thing, but just like too much, just like overwhelming, um, became almost a burden at some point because it was just like all these people trying to help us. I say that, <laughs> I hope you know what I mean when I say that, but it was just, it was a big thing. Um, so then we decided to pay that money forward because we felt kind of guilty about keeping all of it because there's other farms that were having barns collapsing and all this kind of stuff. So we started the Vermont Farm Fund in collaboration with the Center for Ag Economy, which is a nonprofit in Hardwick that sort of coordinates a lot of things in the area. And uh, the Vermont Farm Fund makes no interest or low interest loans to Vermont farmers or local food producers. Uh, we have an emergency side of the fund and a um, innovation side of the fund. We launched it right after Irene. We made uh, $100,000 worth of loans right after Irene, $10,000 loans to farms. Um, it's, a f it's a pretty cool thing because they're, they're short term, they're two year loans. 10,000 bucks, two years. You start making payments right away. Um, so the money starts flowing back in pretty fast and so we can make more loans. So we only have about $170,000 in the, in the account right now or in the total assets of the Vermont Farm Fund, but we can, we're, we're making loans frequently because it's such a short turnaround. And I wanted to do it that way because I'd found in my business time that um, getting money in a no hassle way for a short period of time was really helpful. I didn't need like big long term loans except for buying the farm. I just needed cash when I needed it and I needed not a lot of hassle and we have a very um, minimal loan application. We have a five member board. 
Um, most of the time, somebody on the board knows the applicant. We can sort of do a, you know, just a reference there. And uh, most people spend 20 minutes, send it in, and we send them a check for 10,000 bucks, and they start making payments. And, and the people we've lended to really take a lot of pride in this fund and are excited to pay it back because they want it to go back out to somebody else. And we think it's going to sort of slowly grow now to, you know, be several hundred thousand, maybe a million bucks someday. Um, we're just kind of letting it do its thing. Um, so we had the emergency side first after Irene, and then we just launched the innovation side, which is basically anybody who has an innovative idea for increasing the diversity of local food produced in Vermont. We're, we're interested in hearing about it. We've made a loan to an ice cream company, a Mexican restaurant, a soup company so far on that side of thing. And we, we charge 3% interest on the innovation side and 0% interest on the emergency side. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how you really have a big, big interaction with CSAs? Like, how has the CSA in that culture like, changed and made your business grow? How has the CSA ch made the business grow? Yeah. That, well, it's been a big chunk of our growth for the last four or five years. Um, now, it's seeming a little, there's a lot of CSAs in Vermont now, lots and lots of them. And we don't see it as probably the big growth wave for the next five years if we even want to have a big growth wave, but it feels relatively tapped out. So now we're kind of looking at different ideas of what we could do or want to do. Um, CSA is really good for a farm if you're good enough. You, ha you have to meet certain production goals or you won't have enough food for the, for, for the people you've already taken their money, which can be extremely stressful <laughs> um, to take somebody's money and then not have enough of the right kind of food to make them happy. Um, so it's actually not the best sort of beginner farmer model, but um, it's, uh, when we started doing it, we've only been doing it five or six years, it really helped our cash flow to get a chunk of money ahead of, because, you know, we, like a, like a lot of businesses, but our, you know, our expenses, we, we make all the expenses on our goods when we sell to a store, a restaurant, or farmer's market, sometimes six months before we get money for them. You know, we'll start onions back in February 1st that we're, we're selling, you know, the next May. It's like a year and a half later. We've been spending money on those onions every step of the way. And then a restaurant might take six weeks to pay us. You know, so it's, it's really like, it's a sort of a tough cash flow situation. So to have a component of your business paying you up front is really helpful. And there's, there's ways to do a CSA model with lots of different kinds of businesses. And, and people are doing it now. Um, it kind of got started with vegetable farms, but um, people are ex expanding it far and wide. And if you're in any kind of business with people needing sort of frequent influx of what you provide, I think it can be a really good model. Yeah. Uh, given the popularity uh, of the craft brewery business in Vermont, has there been any uh, interest or even approach in terms of a hop swelling opportunity? I know that there's, there's challenges in terms of soil and humidity. But, you know, if there was anybody, I figured your operation or an operation like yours would be something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know a lot about that. Sean, who runs Hill Farmstead, he has a sign when you walk in and says, I don't want to hear about your hop project. <laughs> 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 because I think <clears throat> hundreds of people in the course of a year think that they want to grow hops. And I think that hops, the little bit I know, are best grown in an arid climate. Um, and are doable here, but and they, these brewers are also looking for a pretty consistent product, I think. Um, I don't actually know of anybody who's like really doing it yet. There could be somebody. Um, we're not, we're stretched, and like we're, we wouldn't be a good fit. It's, it's a whole, <laughs> they require huge trellises and they're long-term perennials and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole other game that wouldn't be something we could do, but uh, I suspect there are other brewers who are a lot more open than he is. Does anybody know? Is there is there a, is there a beer that's in the, paper, like in the last six months about somebody who's trying to do it in Vermont? Yeah. Yeah. Historically, historically, it was it was a huge it was a huge portion of the nation's hops. I read that just the other day. Vermont. Yeah, Vermont. Yeah. Maybe they weren't too concerned with consistent product. Well, you know, it's like we're so used to like. A brewer is used to opening a package and having something that's like bulletproof every time, you know? And that's just not how it always was and not, maybe not how it should be. 
but they're kind of used to that. Um, a, an interesting example of, of something similar is Red Hand Baking Company. A lot of you, I'm sure, know their bread. Um, Randy has been part of our group, the owner, since way back. And he was really resistant to making bread with local flour because he has a, a mill in Nebraska that provides him with just exactly the kind of flour he wants to make exactly the kind of bread he wants. And so we were actually, our CSA was one of the first operations that really pushed him to make bread with local flour. And he, in the past six, seven, eight years, has become this major resource working with local grain growers, of which there are now a bunch, mostly in the Champlain Valley, um, getting them dialed in and growing the right kind of wheat, barley, oats, whatever it is for what he wants to do. And now he's totally gung-ho, and he has several breads that are always on his shelves that are only made with local ingredients. And that's been a really fun transition to be part of. And, and we've been able to help stimulate that in several cases because our CSA needs 400 of something, and then we can give the, we can give the producer instant feedback the next day on an email survey. How do you like this bread? Did you think it was, you know, rate it, whatever. And we send it to them, and they can use it as a, as a trial grounds. And uh, it's perhaps the brewing is like, you know, just starting that six or seven year period that he just went through. That now it's a very established part of his and many other bakers in the state business. And the, the grain growers are getting better and better all the time. And, you know, probably in another 10, 20 years, it's going to be back more like it. Well, I mean, they grew a lot of grain here historically. So. Um, we just love being part of projects like that because it's so fun to see what can be developed in a relatively short period of time and these collaborations that come out of it. Yeah? Coming to the end of an election season where we hear every day that government policy is going to make or break your business. You haven't mentioned government yet. No, we, I mean, we have, we have a really good state ag department in the state. They, they're really helpful. We, well, we get our, we call it farmer welfare. We get our fair share from the feds and from the state. There's, there's all, the last farm bill actually had a lot of money, not a lot of money compared to long-term farm subsidies, but a lot more money for what they call specialty crops, which vegetables fit into. Um, so if you are at all savvy about writing grants and knowing who to talk to, you can get a lot of money. And they basically, the feds have been paying for people to build a $6,000 greenhouse every year for the past four years now. Um, you can build one every single year. Just keep doing it. Um, somebody decided that, that we, we call them high tunnels, greenhouses without heat. Somebody decided that was a good idea. And uh, it's, it's an amazing transition from you know, 10 years ago. And so we have sort of mixed feelings about that. We try to use it sparingly. Uh, we've got a lot of money to do stream bank restoration on our farm. That's been USDA stuff. Um, but we've, and we also, don't, we also don't find that the economy, like what, what's happening in the wider economy doesn't really seem to affect what we're doing so much. People still have to eat. Um, we, we don't say, oh, the economy did great this year. We had a great year. It's more like the weather was nice to us this year, so we had a good year, you know? Um, so that's kind of nice to not be in that whole as, as I think a lot of Vermont is, a little bit insulated from that whole world. Um, but we are very big believers in Michelle Obama and what she wants to do and hope that in a, in a second term, her whole nutrition thing could really skyrocket. Um, we think that uh, there's a lot of power in her ideas and what could happen. Uh, we see over and over again that when kids come to the farm and get good food um, early on, like first, second, third grade, it really changes their perception of what food is. And uh, it's amazing. We have like the local you know, first graders come to the farm. They walk out in the field of greens, and there's all these spicy mustards. And one kid, usually like an adventuresome kid, will, will try one and say, oh, that's good. And then within a minute, every single kid likes the spicy mustard. It's across the board. And I say, you know, 90% of you would not eat that at home. And they're like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and, but, but because somebody did it, and then they, they cut greens, they, they take them to the school, and they have them for lunch. And apparently, they still like them at the school <laughs> because I hear about it from the cafeteria lady. So then they do that for a few days or a few weeks. And then they're going to go home and start talking about it at some point, And then they're going to do something at home eventually. And so that's been so powerful compared to 
mom or dad bringing home something that's foreign and putting it on the table and trying to get a kid to eat it. And we hear this from everybody who works in uh, farm to school stuff that the psychology of kids just works like that. So we're really, really into any government help to help get kids exposed to farms and, and good food at a, the youngest age possible. We have a really nice uh, farmer's market program where they get these vouchers they can only use at farmer's market. And we see people at farmer's market that we know would not come otherwise, and they have to spend, it's a good chunk of money, it's like 30, 40 bucks. And they just load up and, and leave farmer's market. It's awesome, it's powerful, and it, it's gotta be like the best spent money our government can spend. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that leads up to my question, because I was wondering how the, the Northeast Kingdom isn't known for being a very wealthy place. No. And there's going to be a lot of people who can't afford the locally grown f food because it's just not as cheap. Right. And it's this mass-produced stuff. Right. So how do you get that food to those people? It's the biggest, it's the biggest challenge, looking forward. Um, Part of it for us is scale. We've actually been dropping our prices over the past several years. Um, part of it, the food bank is a huge player in this. The food bank comes by our farm and many other farms twice a week. And you know, they, they take 40, 50, 60,000 pounds a year from our place just in stuff that we can't really cook with it. It's just went to farmer's market, came home, perfectly fine, but we can't sell it somewhere else. And she just loads up a big pickup twice a week. And many other farms do the same thing. And, but that's, you know, that's good, but it's not, what we really want is people making enough money so they can either you know, have enough time to grow their own food, good food, or have enough money to buy good food. Um, but we, you know, we see these cultural shifts changing. And it's still true that we spend less than 15% of our income on food, which is the lowest number of any industrialized country. So, most people have some additional margin they could put towards food if they chose to, um, but it would require cutbacks in you know, their car or um, entertainment or some other thing like that. So it's a, it's a long, slow, ongoing project that the more our federal and state government is in tune and working on it, the, the better it's going to happen, you know, the faster it's going to happen. But you know, health care is going to be a super burden for this country long term and this is such cheap money to spend to spend tax money on you know exposing people to better food long term is just so you want to take one last yeah sure you guys want to fight it out or <laughs> <laughs> two we'll do two two quick ones okay. um, other than the migrant workers you have uh, you have other seasonal employees and if so how do you handle the benefits from the healthcare um, We usually have two or three interns every year that they sort of come and they're working for a stipend and then they, they typically get rolled into an hourly employee. That, that happened to the two we had this year. So they don't have any benefits other than all the food they want to eat. And now, once they become hourly after a couple months, they can, they can become part of the healthcare thing if they want. Um, other than that, we typically don't have much seasonal help. Um, because we so, it just doesn't fit into our mix so well. Um, so I read recently that I think Burlington is like now sourcing eight or nine percent of their local foods, which is yeah. you know, people are saying is a good thing. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Vermont? You know, what would you, your ideal be for you know for Burlington and Vermont to be sourced? To well, there's, there's an awful lot of stuff that we all like to eat that we could grow a lot more of here. So I, I don't think twenty five percent in the next. 20 years is an unrealistic goal, you know. Um, things that grow really well in this state are all the root and storage crops. The leafy greens grow really well. It's really, you know, all the tomato products, especially in greenhouses, are, are really easy. Um, it, it's actually a, a pretty nice climate for a lot of things. The grains are really picking up now. Um, but we're still a, a quite a small percentage compared to all the industrial food coming into the state. And part of that's price, and part of it's convenience. Um, you're a CSA member. You you have you have to be willing to cook in a certain way to deal with that. You know, you have this bag of food that shows up that you cannot have rigid ideas about your recipes for the week. It's more like you open the fridge, like, well, let's make something. And only certain people have that mentality. So I think the more different ways that local food are offered to consumers. 
um, through stores and, and uh, farmers markets. And I, I just feel like every time there's a new avenue to, to, to get local food, a whole new group is exposed to it. Um, and you know, we're super busy people and convenience is a big part of it. I think, I think in many ways convenience is a bigger part of it than price for a large percentage of the population. Um, and convenience is also time, and time is money. So that all kind of you know adds up. But um, I think that that's kind of the, the next horizon to figure out how to make it a lot more convenient. Well, thank you all. Thanks for having me. That was great.